The project interdisciplinary collaborative learning and teaching for resilient wood resources and innovation in a digital world is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. The project is co-funded under the strategic partnership of Erasmus Plus with the duration of 36 months. We say that with Wood Plus, objectives are targeted opportunities are taken and make a difference under the Erasmus Plus umbrella. Activities are conducted by consortium of four partners, Mendel University in Brno, Czech Republic, acting as a coordinator, University of Natural Resources and Life Science, Vienna, Austria, University of Hamburg, Germany, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and an associated partner, Innovavut, from Belgium. Wood Plus objectives are to support the additional inspiration of the new generation of researchers, to raise the awareness of a wide range of material application, to redesign the learning environment with innovative online modules, to individualize and internationalize the learning pathways. Woodpath aims to strengthen collaboration in the field of wood science and technology with particular focus on less used wood species, to achieve brain circulation for students and researchers through strengthened language competencies, to contribute to future-oriented curricula with a broader focus on tree species diversity, to develop green sector skills by promoting industrial exploitation of less used wood species for high value chain utilization by focusing on innovative material developments. Wood Plus also aims to stimulate and support students and researchers' creativity by fostering education diversity networks to take advantage of diverse educational and research backgrounds to foster digital competencies by pushing distant learning and innovative learning methods. Wood Plus activities include intellectual outputs such as webinars, ebook, virtual laboratory, experimental design and data analysis, multi-prior events such as conference, and learning, teaching and training activities such as summer schools, workshops and long-term teaching assignments. So uh, the degradation processes in wood are uh, widespread, uh, are uh, universal, and uh, uh, how to say, uh, the wood is uh, rather well recalcitrant. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, not uh, no one organic material uh, is uh, um, is prevented from from any degradation. It uh, always dep depends on the natural condition. It depends on the environment, uh, mostly on water and temperature. So according to amb ambient temperature and ambient humidity. Uh, many fungi uh, bacteria can uh, can uh, inoculate uh, and uh, uh, and inhabit inhabit wood surfaces and start the degradation processes. So we are uh, going to talk mostly about uh, biotic degradation, which can be caused by fungi, which are uh, eukaryotic microorganisms, uh, which can be either uh, filamentous fungi, which are predominant uh, on, uh, in wood and wood material, or bacteria, which are prokaryotic uh, and uh, small and therefore uh, less visible. And uh, also the bacterial degradation is less known, less studies, and uh, there is very little uh, knowledge about them in, uh, in, in literature. So uh, I think that most of you are familiar uh, with uh, some basis or basics of uh, wood microbiology. So you probably know uh, that uh, fungi, uh, degradation of wood by fungi can be classified in three basic categories, uh, white rod, brown rod, and soft rod. So uh, this is uh, 
Uh, this is classification, which is uh, seen in every textbook. And I think uh, everyone uh, has some basic, uh, basic idea how this works. Uh, on the contrary, the bacterial you know, degradation is uh, less known. And um, uh, this is usually, uh, this is usually limited to some erosion and tunneling and cavitation of cellulose layer of wood. So what's the structure of wood? Uh, I here present the picture from my favorite uh, book by Schwarze, 2004. Uh, so the structure of wood is rather simple. It's composed of uh, wood cells, which are composed of cellulose. Uh, but cells uh, form several layers. Uh, you can see you can see here primary wall and three second and three secondary walls, uh, which uh, surround the cell lumen. Uh, and uh, the cell, cell the cells are surrounded by middle lamella, which is composed by lignin and hemicellulose. So what's the difference between, uh, between cells and hemicellulose? Cellulose is composed of glucose. Uh, the molecules are uh, bound by uh, one for beta one for glycosidic bound, while the hemicellulose are composed also by other sugars, uh, especially xylose or mannose or galactose. And uh, uh, they are, the molecules are heavily branches. Uh, that why uh, we are uh, cellulose is uh, mostly unbranched. So um, therefore, uh, the structure of wood of different species, uh, uh, different three species, um, uh, the structure of wood uh, of uh, different uh, age classes of trees uh, is uh, somehow different. And also the portion of lignin can be, can be different. So uh, therefore, uh, the Therefore, the fungi and other microorganisms uh, which uh, are uh, involved in uh, wood degradation have different uh, different ecological strategies how to colonize wood. The micro microbial degradation of wood is enabled due to production of extracellular enzymes. What does this mean? Extracellular enzymes are enzymes which are um, released uh, from the fungal mycelia or can be bound to the um, cell wall of, uh, of um, chitin and beta glucans uh, of fungi. And um, such uh, extracellular enzymes can break down uh, cell walls lignin and Cells. Uh, from the biochemical point of view, uh, the enzymes, extracellular enzymes, can be can be classified into enzymatic classes, uh, hydrolytic or oxidative. So uh, the hydrolytic uh, enzymes are, uh, I would say, more common, uh, but uh, they are involved in all uh, categories of degradation. Uh, most common are endoglucanases, uh, sorbiohydrolases, and there are also analogical enzymes from the degradation of hemicellulose. Uh, so endoglucanase is hydrolytic enzymes which cleave uh, beta-1,4 glycosidic bound. Sorbiohydrolase is uh, degrade degrading sorbios, uh, which is a short molecule uh, of two sugars two molecules of cells bound again by beta-1,4 uh, glycosidic bound. Uh, so each uh, mi microorganism has uh, some uh, battery of enzymes which are uh, used in degradation process simultaneously in, uh, or sequential. It uh, always depends on, uh, on, on condition, on stage of colonization, stage of uh, degrading process. So uh, on the contrary, oxidative uh, enzymes are <coughs> involved mostly in uh, white rot uh, type of uh, wood degradation. More, uh, for example, lacases are uh, very common. They are widespread uh, not only in fungi, but also in other organisms, uh, for example, plants. 
Uh, on the other hand, peroxidase are usually specific. So the, they are specific to some uh, taxonomic or, econo or ecologic group. Uh, wood uh, decaying fungi have uh, special peroxidases. Litter de decomposing fungi in uh, for forest litter have different uh, enzymes which are also similar. And especially manganese peroxida peroxidase is very typical. And um, for bitrot basidiomycetes, especially for polyporales or some uh, agricales. Uh, because peroxidases uh, need uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, so uh, some associated uh, enzymes are also involved in the degradation process. Um, they are so-called supporting enzymes, which are just producing hydrogen peroxide, peroxide which enables uh, proper function of uh, peroxidases. So why fungi uh, are uh, involved in degradation process, it's, uh, it's easy because they are using uh, uh, the sugars uh, released from degraded wood for, for the nourishment. So uh, there is a big question about uh, breakdown of lignin because uh, lignin in fact is a toxic compound. Yeah, this is material. Uh, this is uh, this is chemical compound uh, which involves uh, many uh, phenolic, when uh, many phenolic uh, molecules which are in fact toxic, and uh, they are uh, not preferable as a source of carbon. So uh, it must be uh, keep in mind that uh, lignin itself is not preferential source of Carbon. So uh, let's focus on different uh, on different categories of uh, of uh, degrading process by fungi. Uh, the most common and probably the best known is phytrot, uh, which decompose all components of food, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And uh, this phytrot uh, can be can be classified in two subcategories. Uh, the first is simultaneous vitrot, which, uh, which is the decomposing all uh, components simultaneously. So you can see on, on the upper picture uh, the structure of the partially decayed uh, wood. Yeah, you can see this is really what, uh, really white, this is really rather, rather soft. And the composition process can be rather rather rapid. The most, uh, I wouldn't say common, but uh, the best known examples of uh, simultaneous white rot are Prometheus versicor. You can see this on the picture. This is widespread, widespread uh, fungus uh, in temperate Europe. You can see it on, on an exposed uh, hardwood. Uh, for example, on some on some fans, on some benches, and so and so on. Um, other example of this uh, trust strategy is Perotus ostratus, the oyster mushroom, or Fomes fomentarius, the English name is tender or hoof mushroom or hoof fungus. Um, but this is uh, very common, very common on living trees, but not on processed wood. So the second subcategory of white rot is selective or sequential white rot, where you can see you can see that marmor uh, marmor like structure of uh, the composed wood by Rhododendron pini uh, or Felinus pini. This is all the synonym of this of this fungal species, and you can see that uh, on the picture that um, fungi really selectively decompose some components some components of wood, uh, especially hemicelloses uh, and uh, also lignin. Yeah. Um, the typical examples are some felinus like uh, genera, uh, Brodellaria, here is Fuscoporia uh, contigua. This Fuscoporia, Fuscoporia contigua is uh, usually in uh, woods. Uh, it's usually growing on hardwood. But on processed wood, uh, you can see it also on conifers. Uh, on this picture is uh, spruce uh, fence, which is attacked by this uh, by this fungus. 
So other example is heterobasidum anosum, which this is necrotrophic uh, parasite, which uh, attacks uh, living trees. So uh, brown rot is another another mode of the wood degradation where uh, only polysaccharides are decomposed and the lignin is left as almost uh, intact. Um, there is a mechanical problem of this uh, kind of uh, degradation uh, in, wood, uh, in wood buildings and woodland surveys because uh, when uh, the degraded wood uh, uh, lose uh, mechanical stability, it's uh, very uh, it's very sensitive uh, to breaks and other other mechanical damage. Uh, the very common example is uh, growth of uh, fungi, which are causing this uh, kind of uh, degradation. Is growth film? Uh, here you can see picture of growth growth film. Sapiarium. Also, well-known dry rot fungus, circular lacrimans, belongs to this uh, category of neophora. Uh, you can, uh, um, sometimes you can see also fibroporia species, fibroporia violanti, for example, uh, or as a other example of uh, fungi, fungi which can, which can attack, uh, attack uh, processed wood uh, in building or uh, other uh, processed wood, and as uh, as an example of fungus uh, which attacks mostly mostly living trees is Phomitopsis uh, pinicola. So uh, the last category, which is um, how to say um, less uh, uh, less exactly classified, is soft rot. Um, Soft rots mean decomposition of polysaccharides uh, using the branching orientation of effect roads, uh, which is parallel to orientation of the cells microfibers. So this rot category is not defined according to components which are decomposed, but according to structure of decayed wood. And um, therefore, um, there are some controversies because some authors, uh, uh, some authors uh, sort only uh, only the composition of some external fill as seeds uh, as ketomium to this category. Uh, this um, ketomium is in fact uh, some mold uh, which attacks mostly uh, paper material, fibers of textile according to uh, uh, under humid condition and um, higher temperature this is not typical wood decaying uh, wood decaying fungus on the other hand other authors also sort in this category uh, the decay of wood which is uh, which is characterized uh, by the branching orientation of the growth in parallel of orientation of cells with microfibrils and um, here below here belong mostly xariot ascomycetes, uh, especially Kretschmaria deusta, but also some hypoxons, Dalbinias, uh, so such uh, fungi are uh, usually uh, associated with degradation of uh, living trees, especially if someone uh, of you is familiar in arboriculture, especially Kretschmaria deusta is very problematic species. Yeah. And but on the other hand, some authors also sort here uh, degradation by other uh, lignolytic, uh, but some other fungi, uh, basidomycetes, which has uh, also some lignolytic enzyme, for example, Agnaria or Inonotus. So uh, the definition of this category is a bit messy. So the last, uh, the last uh, slide. Uh, this presentation is also um, a schematic drawing from the book by Schwarze. This is this hasn't been published in, the, in this book, but also in some review, which was later published in journal Fungal Biology Reviews. So um, here you can easily uh, compare uh, compare uh, the schematic strategy of. Uh, other of all basic uh, degradation processes. 
uh, the first picture shows the brown rod uh, where the high far from the high far uh, grows uh, through the cell lumen and uh, cause extensive breakdown of similar hemicellulos and cellulos and uh, but on the other hand not completely uh, there is uh, some substantial uh, uh, remnants of uh, C3 uh, layer, which remains intact. And of course, the matrix of modified lignin persists because this uh, fungus does not have ability of degradation for integration of lignin. Why the S3 remains intact? That's why, because uh, during uh, evolution, brown rot fungi uh, lacked. Uh, uh, some enzymes, uh, especially beta one for endoglucanases, which are which are important for uh, degradation of uh, cellulose cells. Therefore, some uh, therefore some uh, portion of cells remains available in the decayed wood. Uh, this also enables uh, some uh, succession microbial succession. So, uh, in so some other uh, uh, Microorganism can later colonize uh, such uh, partially degraded uh, food, especially some genera of antropodia or skeletal food, which are less known uh, with the king family. So let's move to selected white rot, uh, uh, where uh, hemicellulose and uh, lignin uh, simultaneously occurs. And you can see on the picture that uh, degradation of hemicellulose and uh, lignin um, uh, extends the middle lamella which is opposing. And the process uh, results in separation of individual cells, where the cellulose remains intact of this uh, very, uh, very faintly degraded. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the simultaneous uh, white rod uh, you can see is different. Uh, you can see here uh, extensive branching of hyphae, which grows through uh, all the wood components yeah, and um, penetrate, penetrate not only the cell wall, but also the middle lamella and uh, the degradation is uh, very progressive yeah so later when the lack uh, of uh, level substrate starts uh, the degradation slows down but uh, you can see that uh, uh, wood can be degraded very uh, uh, that wood can be degraded uh, rather quickly on the other hand, the soft rot, here is an example of Sketchmaria Deusta. You can see that the, that the slow degradation along, uh, along the high fee. Yeah. And uh, the formation of cavities, which are very typical, very typical for this uh, category of rot. Uh, the that conically shaped ends can be seen uh, can be seen under the microscope but the similar uh, conically shaped ends can be seen also at the beginning of uh, simultaneous uh, white rod and um, later the secondary uh, wall is almost completely broken down and the uh, middle of the apparatus is because such fungi uh, usually don't have uh, Lignolytic enzymes, which can which can degrade uh, degrade the uh, and uh, uh, and effectively the compost middle. So that's all from uh, my presentation. Here you can see the list of literature. Uh, you can also keep in mind that uh, this categorization of wood decomposing strategies. Uh, is uh, just technical. Uh, we can recognize some transition to, uh, transition to more traditional strategies, and uh, there is lots of uh, lots of very interesting literature about this. So, Hello everyone, my name is Peter Cermak and I'm a member of the Department of Wood Science and Technology at Mendel University in Brno. 
I will shortly speak to topic of development of novel technical wood preservatives in fungal deterioration processes. Mostly, I will be focused on wood modifications. We know that wood as such is unique natural material with large range of possible applications. It's renewable and environmental friendly. As a researchers, we can consider wood as biocomposite with hierarchical structure, which can be observed on various levels of observations from macro to micro and some microscopic scale. On the different levels, we can see different anatomical features of wood and chemical compounds, which are then pretty much responsible for physical and mechanical properties of wood. In general, we can say that wood is anisotropic, non-homogeneous, hygroscopic, viscoelastic, and variable material. Even though wood is perfect material and has many of advantages, it has several disadvantages which has to be taken into account when wood is used. Wood has a natural affinity to water and as a result of moisture content changes, several issues can occur. Firstly, swelling and shrinkage process take place, causing shape distortion, cupping, twisting, and so far. With increase of moisture content, especially above 20%, potential attack by different fungus types increases. In the same time, mechanical properties of wood decrease significantly. This can cause a lot of problems when wood is used for exterior applications, and therefore we deal with something which we call wood modifications. Wood modification involves the action of chemical, physical, or biological agents upon the material, resulting in desired property enhancement during the service life of modified wood. Aim of wood modification is primarily to decrease hygroscopicity and subsequently to increase resistance against biological decay. We can also aim to increase strength, change the color, or increase the hardness. When we deal with wood modification, we recognize several principles. We can reach either temporary or permanent changes in wood properties. First principle is by filling a cell lumina or cell wall by chemical substances. In this case, it's mostly only temporary change, as a substance is typically not anyhow fixed in the wood and can be relatively easily leached out. We can have then some type of chemical reactions with hydroxyl groups, where, for instance, hydroxyl groups are substituted by different molecules, typically with more hydrophobic properties. We can use some type of polymer to cross-link hydroxyl groups, or we can actually change the cell wall structure by thermal decomposition. Here is a table with listed wood modification techniques. We can divide them to chemical processes, thermohydromechanical processes, electromagnetic and plasma-based processes, and other treatments. In the following slides, I will be mostly focused on passive and active substances or modifications. We will speak shortly, for instance, about acetylation, resin impregnation, urea-based processes, or nanomaterials impregnation. Chemical modification is mostly carried out by means of wood impregnation. Wood impregnation is introduction of selected chemical substances into wood in order to improve its characteristics and therefore impart new properties of wood. Several types of substances can be used, for instance, those which primarily improve dimensional stability, those which are hydrophobic, and so far. It is very important to mention that there is a several factors affecting wood impregnation. Impregnability of wood depends on wood structure and permeability of capillary system in wood. Hardwoods are generally easily to be impregnated when compared to softwoods. Diffuse porous structure wood species as beech, poplar, and such are easy to be impregnated. On the other side, spruce, oak with telosis, and so far, are very low or even non-permeable at all. When we speak about wood impregnation, it is also important to mention driven forces. In other words, how water moves throughout the wood. Firstly, we recognize molecular flow, which are diffusion-driven forces, describing movement of gases in wood lumina and free water in microcapillary system in cell wall. Secondly, volumetric flow, which are capillary and pressure-driven forces influenced by pressure gradient. These principles can be described by Fick and Darcy law, while Fick law describes diffusion and Darcy law describes the permeability. In practice, wood impregnation can take a place under various conditions. Firstly, at atmospheric pressure, which is just a simple painting, spraying or soaking, or with change ambient pressure, which can be vacuum impregnation and pressure impregnation. Let's talk about some chemical modification examples. Wood acetylation is one of the most commercially successful modification. It is based on the impregnation of acetic anhydride and chemical reactions at a high temperature. 
In this case, substitution of hydroxyl groups by acetyl groups takes place. Acetyl groups are hydrophobic and molecules itself are much bigger than hydroxyl groups. Therefore, permanent swollen state called cell wall bulking effect can be seen. As a side product of chemical reactions, the acetic acid is produced. As a result of acetylation, hygroscopicity decreased significantly and therefore dimension stability can be improved even up to 80%, pretty much depending on the weight percentage gain values. Also, biological durability is significantly improved. You can see some results of sorption isotherm of reference and modified beech wood, as well as mass loss results caused by the soft rot decay of acetylated pine wood. A is a reference and the rest are different types of acetylation with various weight percentage gain. Here are some examples of acetylated wood used in the structures. Furfurylation of wood is impregnation of wood by furfural alcohol, where mainly polymerization take place during chemical reactions. Furfural alcohol blocking absorption site in the cell wall, which are not anymore accessible for water molecules. Process is similar to previous example. It means impregnation of substance, initiation of chemical reactions, curing and drying stage take place. In case of furfurylation of wood, properties are improved significantly, similarly to acetylated wood. What is important to mention here, during the process, color of wood is changed to darker shades. However, when exposed to outdoor environment, it turns to silver gray shade. Again, here are some examples of the use. Here is an example of impregnation of dimethylol dihydroxyethylene urea, where mainly crosslinking of hydroxyl groups take place. Great improvement of dimension stability and biological durability can be seen here as well. There is one disadvantage of this process that as a result of structure crosslinking, modified wood has a lower toughness. Here are some examples of this treatment. Here is an example of resin modification. It is still not fully clear if we speak here about active or passive modification, which was still not fully proven, and it depends on what type of resin is actually used. Different kind of synthetic resins can be impregnated into the wood in a liquid state. After the curing, the substance physically prevent water to penetrate into the wood. Here is some example of melamine formaldehyde resin modification process. Last but not least, nanoparticles impregnation. We are talking here about active modification with particle sizes between 1 to 100 nanometers. Typically, we can have three main ways to use nanotechnology to modify wood. Firstly, nanometal impregnation. Secondly, assisted modification where nanoparticles is used to carry some other preservative. And finally, coating treatment. Most commonly known are metal nanoparticles as gold, copper and silver and metal oxides such as zinc and aluminium. Here you can see some examples of improved properties of wood impregnated by nanoparticles. Dimensional stability as well as the resistance against microorganisms are significantly improved. You can see here massless results for pine wood exposed to termite test on the left, as well as the decay test on the right. To make some conclusions, proposed and presented chemical modifications are among the others suitable methods to improve wood properties. These changes result in many technological advantages when compared to non-modified wood. All methods improve significantly moisture-related properties, mainly dimensional stability, as well as biological durability. Applicability of these treatments is affected by several factors. The most important is wood species and its impregnability and permeability, presence of hardwood, moisture content, type of substance, and conditions of the process. Thank you very much for your attention. As I already mentioned, I will talk about some of our, some of our experiences or results of our field testing or other testings performed on different topics or different um, on different materials that are derived, let's say, from wood. I mean, we all know that um, wood is one of the most, let's say, it is gaining in important as a building material. It's used for a variety of applications from building, as we see it on the previous picture, or for, let's say, construction applications. Uh, right now, in Slovenia, we have, let's say, rather ongoing discussion, or let's say there are different opinions, especially the non-expert public 
whether there is need to protect wood. There is always a question, can we somehow avoid wood protection with, uh, let's say, proper time of filling, pro uh, cutting, proper drying, proper whatever. I mean, and this question is very tough. It's not easy, it's very, it's not that easy to answer it. But when, whenever someone asked or let's say proposed or whatever, show me this uh, question, I always usually show them two images. One is this one. It's true story, as you can see, it's from the Guardian. Mm, it describes the accident that happens in California, Berkeley, where six students died, died because of the poorly constructed balcony on the student's dormitory. Of course, usually are not protecting this timber, but that's one of the indications that with a, with a building physics and with a design, it's very hard to uh, address this issue. The second example, which I show is usually is example from the Czech, Czechia. Um, I don't know where I got, where, who was the first one to show it to me, but there is a um, building in summer and let's in the touristic area. And there is a, that's how the building looks like. Actually, I don't even know it's a, if this is a church or uh, any kind of monument. But if you step on this bridge, there is, out, there is internet camera. So you can take a picture and then download it at home. And that's an image of one of the families. It's not edited. It's just an image of one of the family that took a picture on this um, bridge before it collapsed. Luckily, nobody died. There, were, there was just some people who were, let's say, seriously injured. Injured, mm, and mm, what was the consequence? The consequence was that the bridge was rebuilt in mm, steel construction. So, what I usually want to show the students with this case that is building with wood in outdoor application requires a lot of knowledge. Some people are overestimating their experiences with um, this kind of material. And this trend of building with wood can turn into the directly opposite direction if we will not be able to provide good solutions, sustainable solutions, safe solutions for wood. I mean, in rather easy, it, I mean, the public opinion can turn into, let's say, the, let's say more, let's say, of, away from wood, let's say, into this kind of uh, constructions. I, don't, I mean, so that's why I believe that we do need the wood protection, let's say, also in the future. But another question is, do we need the wood protection as it is, as it was before? I mean, the classical wood protection, that was, let's say, a corner, let's say, of the wood uh, industry, let's say, in the last century, it was based on the toxic chemicals. That was that were somehow, somehow introduced to the wood and that used for different applications. So I think, I believe that this is a history. Today we look on the wood protection completely, completely different. And the key reasons for that are, let's say, uh, originated the let's into the multitude of the let's decision. One of the reasons for this, for the huge changes that happened in Europe is legislation. The majority of the classical biocides were banned in the European Union. So, we have less and less biocides uh, on the market every day. We will hear that we will hear this legislation issue also addressed in the let's say, one of the last presentations today. A second trend that was uh, influencing the use of wood is protection of tropical forests. People do not want to use tropical forests. I mean, people are aware that overexploitation of the tropical forest, which was a source of high quality durable material, is not sustainable. So people want to use more and more domestic species. Another trend that was, let's say, um, that is going on in Europe is development of so-called eco-beer trends. People want to live in environment without chemicals. The, the people who decide to have a house, this, there, there are certain reasons for that. For that. There are some, uh, there are 
some there's something leading to them. Usually, one of the key reasons for the for the decision of to, to build a wooden house is the wish for natural and healthy environment. So that's why people want to have uh, wooden houses, and that's why they want to avoid biocides. And in parallel, also with the modification develop, and all this resulted into let's say the new um, trends in the wood protection. And how do we look on the wood protection today? Is we believe that what is called food protection is utilized of first we have to know how to select food and if we want to know how to select food we have to understand the certain wood species we are using biocides for wood protection only if there are no other alternatives available i mean other, if, otherwise we try to use let's say different modification techniques or let's say hydrophobic techniques and we have to know how to apply the protection by construction principles and maintenance. And today I will talk mainly talk about this first topic, uh, how to select the wood, how to select the best wood based on the, let's say, different our, uh, our different results. This graph shows one of the issues that we're having in Slovenia, but this issue is, let's say, typical for most of the Europe. I mean, the majority, 90% of Slovenian wood species does not have durable wood. So if you want to use those wood species, uh, if you want to use, let's say, all of those wood resources that we have in the forest for building applications, we have to find a way how to improve the durability of this material. And that's, what, let's say, or how to use it or how to build it. And we have another issue within this topic, uh, within this field, we have, the climate changes. I mean, so the issue with these climate changes that we have is that the properties of material uh, that uh, were, let's say, known for centuries, or let's say, that were known to let's say, our parents and grandparents changed. Um, we have performed, let's say, together with the Slovenian Forestry Institute, our kind of research inventory, and the average density of Slovenian spruce, of Slovenian conifers, that's mainly spruce, fir, and large, decreased for 10% in last, let's say, 40 years. Let's say, if we compare the situation today to the situation 40 years ago, uh, the, den the, wood, let's say, the density of the wood is, let's say, 10% lower than it was before. So there's a question whether the properties of the wood species that we are relying let's say on the base of the literature are still comparable uh, to the let's say, are still representative to the wood species that we have today another issue is that also the climate changes um, that's why we'd like to show you one of the let's say just a short graph about um, change of the climate in slovenia only mm, we calculated the so-called Schaeffer climate index this was the index that was developed in the US and somehow indicate the severity of the climate, uh, let's say for the development of the wood decay in certain location. It is somehow a tool that helps us uh, to understand the threat for the wood decay in certain conditions. And these are the situation for some of the Slovenian cities. Uh, and we have two columns here and the first column, like over here, represents the, the average Shepherd climate index 50 years ago. And the trend here indicates the Shepherd index, let's say, for the last decade. And we calculate the Shepherd climate index, let's say, for, let's say, for, the, for the locations in Slovenia where the data are available. And what we can see here that the Shepherd index increased, let's say, for example, for 10 points in most of the locations. But the most prominent increase was at the, let's say, Mountain Wallis. For example, that's approximately 800 meters above the sea level. And the reasons for that are rather simple. The winters are warmer and warmer. Um, the regime of the rainfalls has changed. And this, this somehow indicates, in this case, that as the locations from here, let's say, uh, indicated, let's say, that like, the displace was moved from um, uh, the Alps to the Athens. That's the, that's the move that is observed. So the climate has changed drastically. So the case is going faster and faster, but the buildings are still there. The wood is still there. So there's always a question whether uh, 
um, whether um, can we rely on the past experience or can we rely on the expert opinion? So are we sure that the results from the past are still valid today? Just a second. Okay. And that's why we made a questionnaire. We showed 20 examples, 10, 20 different objects from bench just to the fences from Slovenia, Germany, Norway, later different countries to 300 persons. Those 300 persons came mainly from Slovenia, Norway, and Germany. And they belong to the different groups of the people. They belong, let's say, to the experts that deal with wood, let's say, for their whole life. They we use, we apply for scientists, architects, students, everything. So we have a group of 300 people. And we ask them whether they can estimate. We tell them, for example, this bench is made of large wood and it's located in Lugan. And we ask them, can you predict how long will this bench last? Or how, when will the decay develop? And then, because we just want to see whether people expert or can predict the service life of the different materials, or can they properly select the material for such an application? Um, and this is the results. That's the results of the expert group of the 300 people. The correlation between predicted and actual service life was, well, you can see it close to zero, 0 0.14. This is this somehow indicates that an expert opinion is somehow overrated. I don't say that there was no one who can um, predict, let's say, how the material will perform in such an application. That's I think it's possible. But uh, if you if you if you identify someone as expert, it was self uh, categorization. Those persons decided to be experts on their own, and then we try to, let's say, apply the model into, let's say, to try to predict the service life using different models. And that was much, much, much more accurate. Let's say we have the um, correlation of 0.9%. So th that's why we somehow indicated those models are much more reliable for, the, for this kind of uh, indications than, um, than experts' opinion. So that, that we, we somehow believe that expert opinion is overrated. But um, in related to these materials, it's always, always a question, if someone develop a new material, it's always a question how to test it to get reliable results that can be used as also for the wider public. That's why we, 10 years ago, actually, it will be in October, it will be 10 years ago, we built this kind of house. We call it a model house. It's built of let's say, roughly 20 different materials, uh, Norris spruce, large beech, sweet chestnut, Scots pine, um, black poplar, and ash. And we use different treatment solutions. We usually use the solutions that are available on the market. That's, we use it, uh, we use the rocks treatment, we use surface coating, we use copper based with preservatives, and we also thermally modify this material. And then we combine, for example, thermally modification with lab. And then we are running different monitorings on this house for like uh, now for almost 10 years. And that's how the house looks like, let's say after renovation, today it's re re renovated. So some of the materials are completely degraded, some of them are missing. So, and uh, we also installed within the house, let's say roughly 300, 400 sensors where we moisture the, uh, where we log the moisture content, temperature and different conditions and we try to link all these let's say to the development of the decay what we learned let's say from the past experiences that um, if you want to let's say predict the service life of the wood above ground we usually have to rely on let's say several parameters not only one and let's say two of them are most influential. And usually we talk about the inherent durability and water exclusion efficacy. And that's what we want to test it also within this house. And that's why that's one of the results let's say, that was obtained in this house. It's at this house shows the number, number of the dates 
number of the day, percentage of the days with when the moisture content of wood exceeds 25%. 25% was chosen as the limit moisture content for uh, development of the wood decay in wood. It's, we have to know that it was de determined only in one location that actual overall moisture content might be different on let's say some different parts of the material. And this indicates that the, the, this indicates the result of the let's say almost 6,000 measurements of moisture content that is performed on each material. We can see from this graph that there is rather big difference between those materials. But the key question in our case was, can we correlate that to the decay? And when we try to correlate it to the decay, it was very, very, rather hard. Mm -hmm. And for example, these are the results of the decay. We can see different years and different materials, and we can see different numbers. Mm -hmm. Those numbers from zero, from to zero to four indicates the development of the decay. Zero means sound wood. Four means completely degraded wood. We can see, for example, that spruce wood specimens were developed up, they were degraded after five years under these conditions. Um, that was the fastest decay. For example, beech wood was degraded after six years um, and some other materials. So five materials were completely gone after five years. On the other hand, some other, let's say, modified materials remain rather fine, let's say, even after nine years up to now. Um, so, but the question is, sometimes we don't have 10 years of time to get this kind of result. The question is, how to, is it possible to get these results faster? For example, based on the moisture content measurements that I show you. But when it, we try to link it to the moisture content, that was not sufficient. So mm, that's why we decided to try this factor approach to quantify the resistance dose. Um, this idea was developed by, um, within the PhD of Linda meyer filter And she developed like eight tests that can be performed in the laboratory, let's say in half a year. And those tests uh, indicate two different properties of the material, like wetting ability and durability. For wetting ability, we usually think about capillary water uptake from the uh, ex axial direction, directions in 200 seconds, liquid water uptake, water vapor uptake, and let's say the ability of the wood to dry. Uh, when we assess the inherent resistance or inherent durability, we talk about let's say, resistance to the soft rot organism, brown rot fungi, white rot fungi, and if possible, also let's say the in-ground test. Uh, but that's not a must, it works without them. And based on that, we can calculate the relative durability. Um, the relative within this methodology, the Norway spruce is used as the reference material. So uh, Norway spruce, PCR ABS always has the factor of one, always, that's a standard. So if certain material has the number, the factor higher than one, it means that it's more durable than spruce. If it has a value of lower than one, it's less durable than wood. And another thing that can be considered here are those values. For example, value two means that this material will perform two times better than spruce. So that the service life of wood treated with, for example, with uh, a, a VAC solution, a mountain VAC, will perform three times better than spruce. For example, the wood treated with, uh, the, for example, oak should perform six times better, large should perform uh, very large, three times better, and so on. And when we calculated these values, we compare them with um, actual performance of our, the, of the data from the, let's say, our um, model house. And we can see that, we have the, get rather good correlation. Let's say um, we get correlation of 0.7%, which is okay, let's say, for this kind of test, because we, we are involving, let's say, um, very heterogeneous material. And I have to say that the laboratory material was not exactly the same as it was uh, the one built in the 
uh, model house because we did not think about it beforehand. And then there are some outliers, for example, predominantly thermally modified wood uh, was performing better than indicated from the graphs. And of course, we just we want to validate all those data as well. That's why we analyze the separate um, part of the building. We analyze the roof. The roof was made at approximately at the same time as um, the decking, but it was made of three wood species only. The upper roof was, was made of spruce. This part was made of thermally modified wood, and uh, there was some also copper treated material available on the market. On the, Material. And what, for example, that's a typical shingle from the spruce. It's made of spruce wood, which was completely degraded, especially the part that was exposed to the weathering, while the other materials like um, copper treated material and thermally modified material perform much, much better. And with the exception of, the, let's say, a little bit of surface corrosion, the, there was almost no decay on the thermally modified wood after nine years. So even let's say when you compare different exposure on the same object, uh, the, we got, let's say, the same result. Of course, on this building, we are not testing only the durability of the material. We're also testing, let's say, the other properties of the material. And one of the companies that we're working on this um, house is company producing windows. It's, um, and they are very interested in to use, let's say, thermally modified wood as a building material. That's why we installed this window into the house and equipped it with a variety of the sensors measuring dimensional instability, temperature, moisture content, and also the heat flux. All those red sensors are measuring the heat flux through the windows. And what was noticed on this, um, window on this uh, object is that if I explain the graph a little bit, the red, the red uh, line indicates the sun solar radiation. This somehow indicates uh, how much solar radiation was, let's say, gained on this uh, surface. The black line indicates the outdoor temperature. And the green light indicates the indoor temperature. Of course, there are some variations. Indoor is heated. And the orange line indicates the heat flux to the spruce wood. And the blue line indicates the heat flux to the thermally modified spruce. And what we can see here is that the heat flux from through thermally modified wood is much lower than the heat flux to the spruce. And this means that we can get much, much better uh, thermal conductivity of this window, let's say, if it's made of thermally, of thermally modified material. And we get much, much better service life. And based on this idea, the company also made the, uh, commercialized it, this idea, and made a windows, commercial, commercially available. And um, this idea was awarded as best by wooden window for passive house, by the Pacific House Institute uh, eight years ago. So it was commercialized somehow. But our idea is also, let's say, to use the, all those beams, uh, like all those materials also, let's say, for other outdoor applications. That's why we think about and redesign one of the experiments with Milan to let it stimulate whether we can use material of smaller dimension and make kind of model glue lamp beams of different materials. We use a lot of materials for this, but I'm showing you the results of spruce and thermally modified spruce and beech wood only, uh, because it's, there's no time to show everything. And those, also those beams were exposed, as you can see here, let's say above ground, half a meter above ground in outdoor conditions. And every year we isolated one beam and we analyze it in details to determine the mechanical properties and the properties of the adhesives. Um, and what you can see here are, let's say, two beams. The left one is um, what's happening with spruce wood and the right one is, indicates what's happening with beech wood. You can see that beech wood is much more degraded than spruce wood. Um, 
while um, on the other hand, on the spruce wood, you can see that the first sign of decay started let's say, after two years. That's that can be seen this browning here. And after the third and fourth year, the degradation mainly starts on the middle layer, or let's say close to the somehow close to the adhesive sand. It was clearly brown road decay. Us, we and we heard all about the brown road decay that's in our uh, in the previous presentation. On beech wood, we can see that the beech wood, um, the beginning there was the signs of the white road decay. You can see this whitening. But in the later stages, there was also white row decay and brown row decay. And the beam after four years was completely gone. It was impossible to cut it. On the other hand, if the materials were made of thermally modified material, there was no degradation on the spruce wood, while um, there was, there were, let's say, a lot of cracking developed in the beech wood. There was no decay, but only cracking. We think that the action of those different lamellas that was adhesed together was um, uh, too much, and the mechanical property of the thermally modified wood is kind of keen to cracking. So, this thermally modified wood doesn't prove the best for this application, while spruce wood performed perfectly. And of course, we're not satisfied just to let it test it, let's say, in one object. That's why we try to. Um, we built a model house, another model house, that's model house two, in the park in Musiria. It's a park, um, it's public, where people, where we install, build this house together with one of the Slovenian companies producing these kinds of houses. And we, we just want to show it to people. We just want to, that people who are passing by, see how this house performs, uh, performed, let's say, in. Um, through, the, through some years. And we have installed also a lot of moisture sensors within this house. And we also use Cantronic equipment. And we install it, let's say, into in-ground, let's say, to the untreated material, to the to different beams. And after, now it's like 14 years of exposure with, let's say, also with a climate ranging from minus 10 to plus 30, 40 degrees, uh, it's a rather humid area. We notice that uh, moisture content of all thermally modified wood is much, much, much lower than moisture content of spruce wood. And the, um, even if the material of this, if the thermally modified material is exposed, let's say in certain locations to the rainfalls, the durability of the thermally modified wood is sufficient to, let's say, prevent the development of decay in this respective location. So we think about it, with, this, with that, we just want to somehow monitor the, the object to see if um, this object, if this material, what will happen in the future in, let's say, within years of use with this material to be sure, let's say, to optimize, let's say, it if necessary. And because we believed in this material thermal modification, we decided also to use it as a cladding for, let's say, our newly built, it is not newly, it was built like eight years ago, building a department of food science and technology. And we use this object also as an experimental object, let's say, to see the performance of the material. But another aspect that is also important, let's say, with uh, wood in outdoor application is also the visual appearance. That's one of the topics that we addressed in recently because we get more and more complaints about the customers who bought a house that looks like that, the one on, on the left when they order it. And after a few years, it turned into the completely opposite appearance. The problem is that in most of the commer commercial promotional material, the house is always advertised in, let's say, this reddish large, large white spruce, um, and then this discoloration caused a, a lot of problems. That's why we try to estimate which factors are contributing to these color changes. I mean, we can see that we try to explain to people that they should not select the material based on how it looks when it's new, but they should see it on our, let's say, model house, on our exhibition, around our department and decide on the 
for the material based on the appearance of athletic first, second year. And that's why we try to measure also the color of this model house that we talked about today. And that's, that's, that's the representation of these color changes in, uh, of this model house within time, let's say during the first four years. And we can see that after the fourth year, the visual appearance of most of the material looks almost the same, with the exception of the material that was treated with uh, surface coating, brown niche surface coatings. That was the only, that was the only, let's say, so this brown color somehow slowed down this graying. And when we try to understand why and this happens and which factor contributes most uh, into these color changes. We expose different materials, let's say to different biological factors. For example, there is, here's a control, brown earth fungi, white earth fungi, blue stain fungi, and artificially accelerated weathering. And the last column represents the, the color of the material that was exposed outdoor for nine months. And what we can see, what we can conclude from this uh, image is that if we want to simulate, if we want to gain the color of the material that was exposed outdoor, we have to somehow combine the color of the blue stem fungi and uh, um, UV-induced degradation, um, and that results into the outdoor color uh, of the material. We repeated these experiments with, um, mm, uh, let's say, with another set of tests where we first exposed the materials to the blue stem fungi, then we artificially, artificially aged them in the climate chamber with the exposure to the UV light, rain, and infrared light. And after the second year, or after the second exposure to the blue stem fungi, we got, let's say, comparable color to what is to the color of the wood exposed outdoor, let's say, for a few years. Uh, and in order to, let's say, it, so what we believe, let's say, based on these results, is that the, outdoor, the color of the wood exposed in outdoor condition in Ljubljana, it cannot be um, extrapolated to the other regions, is a function of UV induced degradation and development of the boosting function. And because we want to, because we want to see how fast is this process, we expose, let's say, for example, the spruce wood material to the outdoor conditions for one to sixteen weeks, and you can see on this image how the blue stain developed on the surface. You can see that the first signs of the blue stain were noted after four weeks, and after sixteen weeks, it looks like that this wood was printed with inkjet black color material uh, completely. That after 16 weeks, the wood was completely gray. And the same story was noticed, the same pattern was noticed also at large wood, while when we use the biocide treated wood that, preserved, that prevented the development of the blue stain fungi, uh, there was no sign of blue stain growth and also the color was a bit lighter and a bit different. We believe, and um, unfortunately, I don't have the data here, that let's say the blue stem fungi will also grow on this material, but you, we need more time for that. We need, let's say, more, uh, we need additional month or two, let's say, for blue stem to develop on this material. In addition to that, I mean, we try, let's say, to test the material, let's say, on different locations. I mean, we have designed this kind of bench um, made of, different conifers and we made all eight of those benches and they're exposed in Italy or Slovenia in the Alps, close to the seaside and uh, also in Bosnia, Italy, Italy as well. And we want to compare different climates, how they influence on the performance of this material. But what we can conclude by now is that um, the changes are comparable, only the, the velocity of the changes is different. So we believe that the prediction of the service life is possible. We believe that um, 
old material that we show here, or that I like to also use here, like copper treated material and thermally modified material and natural durable material that can be used as for different applications. But each material should be used for specific application. Um, and we have a tools to predict the service life of this material uh, faster than using the um, just classical uh, outdoor tests. But, um, and those laboratory tests are, rather, uh, let's say, are rather in line, let's say, with the test, um, with the results that are performed in field. At the end, I have to mention that all those tests the performance of all those tests would not be possible without the help of our supporters uh, from industry, different European and regional projects. Uh, we really do, uh, we appreciate this support. And we are always open for different type of um, collaboration questions uh, related to wood. And I'm really happy to answer additional questions. If you have any right now online or I'm happy to address them also, let's say, via email if you want to ask those questions later on. What is age? What's behind? And what's the purpose of this uh, European legislation? And also, what's the impact for, let's say, industrial or professional application of uh, chemical substance, uh, which are uh, I would say part of the all activities uh, and also uh, wood preservation, etc., etc. Et uh, and uh, it's uh, let's say sometimes uh, as a black box for 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 user uh, how to how to work with it. Uh, generally, the each legislation uh, process or each uh, uh, legal uh, act is uh, that's the first new approach uh, which consolidated chemical. Uh, legislation uh, across the Europe. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, I would say, new approach uh, which was was taken uh, in uh, many years ago. Uh, the, the first time when when it was published was on, on January 14th, uh, 2015. Uh, but uh, the uh, real act of this uh, of this uh, of, of of this uh, legal act start, start, started uh, in uh, in a period after. Generally, I would say that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big book uh, of uh, the different legal text, uh, which is contained from 15 heads and 17 annexes. I would say the, uh, the, the annexes, which is, uh, uh, as usual, quite important for uh, uh, application and understanding of, 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 the, of, this, uh, of these activities. It's now, you, you can see it on the screen. Uh, uh, just, uh, just, just briefly, uh, some of them are related to, to the registration process and collecting the data, uh, chemical substance placed in, in Europe. Sec uh, the other ones are uh, in the next phase. That means about the restriction and let's say tuning of the chemical substance used on uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, important part uh, of annexes uh, of annexes and also the, all uh, each activities is is related to dossiers and socio economic analysis because. Uh, impact of uh, regulation of chemical substance on market uh, on market is uh, really wide and is is linked to to everyday life of uh, each uh, uh, EU inhabitants. Uh, in head of head of uh, all these activities is a European Chemical Agency, which was established uh, in uh, June in June two thousand seven in in Helsinki. Uh, from a uh, from organization scheme of this of this big big agency, uh, I would I would like to. To to uh, to to underline the the member state committee com uh, committee for risk assessment and committee for social economic analysis as a study bodies which uh, has that quite uh, important influence uh, to uh, let's say follow up on and uh, development of of all activities related to chemical substance now in Europe. Member state committee uh, uh, is is very very active in uh, in in summits of uh, nomination of. Substance of very high concern and the authorization process that means first step of uh, any restriction of chemicals uh, for use in Europe. Uh, of course, uh, committee for risk assessment is 
uh, is let's say some more scientific, not 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 political like member states committee, and it's very important for uh, for let's say let's say assessment of the uh, of the risk uh, and the dividing uh, information uh, which uh, which is uh, followed by the by each of these chemicals, and uh, social social economic analysis uh, committee uh, is a uh, it's important for uh, for interest of society industries and application and and about this also also for uh, for the people in europe uh, what uh, would be the impact of any restriction or any limitation of chemical substance uh, for everyday lives uh, last but not least also forum which, which ensures awareness of enforcement of the regulation it, uh, it would it would be uh, called as as a group of the enforcement uh, enforcement bodies uh, which helps to 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 make a pressure on the industry uh, and uh, and users to not use the substances which are not okay for uh, for Europe, uh, but according to their each. So some basic definitions which we should take uh, into consideration uh, when we speak about their each. Uh, chemical substance as as a chemical individu individuum. Uh, with this uh, unique uh, chemical composition and uh, coding mixture uh, as, as a combination of different or variety of chemical substance uh, in one material. Uh, in, when we speak about a mixture, we, we should, uh, we should uh, make differences between main parts uh, or main compositions of the mixture and, uh, and, and let, let's say the, 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 the mi mi minority and uh, the substances in the uh, in the mixtures, uh, very important category is article. Art article uh, uh, is, is something what will be used every day, and to, and uh, the chemical uh, composition is not the the, the first uh, in the level of importance, but the, the shape uh, also will form the, the importance of uh, this uh, article. Uh, but in case of article, we also sh uh, should mention some chemicals which is inside the articles. And we, we should divide it if the use of this chemical substance is intentional or not intentional. Typical example of article with uh, intentional use uh, would be a cartridge for print uh, for, for printers, which we use for, for our everyday work in uh, in the offices. And uh, the ink inside uh, as a chemical substance, but uh, intentionally used uh, for such a process. Also, uh, from uh, from legal legal perspective, we should uh, dif make differentiation between producer, downstream user, and importer. Producer uh, uh, is, a, is a subject who, uh, who produced this chemical substance, and uh, in most of the cases, also place it to, uh, on, on the market. Uh, in case that uh, producer is out from outside of European Union, a uh, very important role uh, become to be to, to an importer. That means that the any uh, company or any uh, institution which placed as a, as a first uh, the, the, this chemical substance on the European market. Uh, related to this to this role, there are, there are a lot of uh, lots, uh, lot, lot, lot of requests to this importer uh, to to, uh, to be in contact with European Chemistry Agency and to, and with the local local national bodies to. to to share the data and uh, and classification of chemical substance, and uh, also responsible for uh, not crossing any of each uh, uh, regulations. Downstream user means uh, from from the name, uh, it, it's quite clear that it's a user of chemical substance uh, uh, which is not in position of producer, but just just in brackets to use it this chemical substance for application. Uh, then, but when we speak about the downstream user, uh, there, are, there are two typical uh, typical let's say positions as a final user, which would what, what, what we can be one one of us who use any chemical substance to to apply it to such a such a application or such a material, or professional user where we should take into consideration also health and safety aspect for workers. Uh, some overview on the registration scheme between 2010 and 2018. What now probably looks as a quite old information, but it's important because uh, in the, in the beginning there were not, there were not uh, let's say uh, single uh, data sets on on the European chemical market, uh, and uh, it was it, it was started when uh, 
all chemical substances should be somehow registered or pre-registered uh, in the system of, of ECA. Uh, this scheme, which are, now I, I uh, put it on the screen, is, is, is very important also in case of any new chemical substance now will come to the European market. And uh, very similar classification will, will be used for, uh, for the identification of the, of the request to the to, to subject who produce or place it on, on, the, on the market. Only with one exception, and that this exception is uh, regarding, the, regarding the timelines, because uh, here now we are in a situation that, uh, that uh, any new chemicals cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, pre-registered because it was uh, only a special case uh, for chemical substance, which was used and known for, uh, for European market before uh, starting of this registration scheme. Uh, main principles of registration. Uh, the, this first letter of the of the name reach. Uh, the main principles is, is uh, avoid uh, the use of dangerous substance on the European market and define possible use and also uh, identify uh, if the use of this chemical substance uh, uh, is in community interest. Also, the uh, all registration. Uh, uh, help to collect data of, of chemicals or, or, chem or chemicals in uh, European Union. According to this, uh, classi uh, according to this uh, collecting of the data and classification of, of the chemical substance and uh, what is sustainability of, of use uh, will, will be discussed or is discussed on, on the social, social economic relevance. And later on, uh, in case uh, of uh, uh, finding some dangerous uh, specification of substance. Uh, there, there's a start to process uh, how to how to eliminate this risk and uh, also to try to, to test it uh, of the real Im impact. The very important point is uh, that uh, the, the target of reach is uh, is collect information about uh, 30,000 chemical substance which uh, what, uh, which are on the European market. That's a rough estimation because uh, every year the change the number is changing. But important is from 2020, the use of chemical, only chemical substance with, with known properties uh, is possible on, on the market, with exception of the new, new uh, chemical substance which comes to the market. Well, what, what, what is, uh, what is uh, let's say, uh, aspect of the registration? All chemicals should be identified by CAS or INEX number. Uh, CAS, CAS number uh, as a chemical abstract service uh, uh, system uh, which collect uh, the let's say, all uh, known chemical substance and uh, give them the special code. Uh, for Europe, we use the INEX, uh, European Inventory of Existing Commercial Chemical Substance, which uh, was used mainly in the in the first phase of registration, but still it's in place uh, as a legal uh, legal tool to uh, identify the chemical substance. Minimum for, reg for registration is one ton per year. Uh, which is placed on the European market. Important point is that, 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 that this, this uh, limit is related to the one specific single uh, single uh, subject. Who can uh, who can register the, the, uh, for, for each subject? Ma, ma, uh, it must be based in the EU. It's very important, uh, especially in case of uh, imports of any chemical substance from third countries. When we speak about about the uh, EU-based subject. Uh, we, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, forget that that Europe uh, the Europe is now or European Union to be to be correct is now uh, is now without the uh, United Kingdom, and it's very important because uh, United Kingdom uh, based uh, companies were in the past quite active in the registration processes uh, 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 in Europe. Also, uh, uh, also uh, we should uh, define some exemptions which which uh, chemical substances are not. Part of the registration requirement is uh, it's Annex 4 and 5, which define the condition when uh, we can take a substance as an exemption. Typically, it's natural origin materials without chemical or any other technological treatment. Uh, as an example, when, uh, when, you use, when, you use the, when you use the sulfur, which is from, from, from the earth, and but when, but when you, when you, when you, uh, uh, when you you use the sulfur uh, in treatment uh, and make the make the structure and uh, and uh, the, 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 the surface by some chemicals. Then 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 you change it and then and then it's out of the exemptions. All registration is always 
you know, collect, uh, lined with, uh, with some fees. Uh, these are, are usually in the, in the tens of thousands of euros by one chemical substance and one subject. But uh, these fees are, are also, di uh, also divided by the size of the company, by the chemical substance, and by the classification of the substance. Uh, to, uh, uh, of course, there are some ways how to limit it, the, uh, the, these fees, and also the tests, which should be done on, uh, on, the, on the each chemical substance. And for, for, such, a, for, 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 for such a process, uh, there, there is possible to use the CF and, and, uh, and the consortium. Uh, because uh, to one uh, a restriction dossier, you you need uh, did it uh, just for chemical substance, but you, you can share the you can share the uh, the, the, the these duties uh, among the among the other partners if you find a way how to how to make uh, how to make uh, any agreement with them on the consortium. Uh, basic uh, basic uh, uh, idea of each is let's say no data no market. I mean if we have any chemical substance where we we don't have enough sufficient data about the dangers of this substance. It's not possible to uh, to follow uh, the market with such a chance. Important point is that uh, 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 registration and registration number is very important obligation for material safety data sheets for all uh, for all uh, let's say chemical substance and mixtures. Registrance uh, 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 is the first uh, 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 who uh, act uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a part of, of the uh, system in case of, of producer uh, or import. Uh, in both cases, uh, this, this company should, should have in, in their hand uh, all important data. In case uh, of uh, any consortium, uh, one lead registrant or person as an entity who, who has these, uh, these processes is uh, is uh, is a reliable presence for for ECA to, uh, to 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 this process. And important mention is that uh, in case that the, uh, we have also direct imports uh, to, of chemical substance to the, to the European Union, uh, not via traders or via importers, then uh, these chem these chemical producers from outside of e uh, of EU should appoint their own representative uh, uh, for. Uh, for this import and acting uh, acting to, to registration process uh, via each. Uh, in, in, in both cases, uh, or, or all three cases, import the producer or OR, you should uh, have uh, uh, you should have a data for registration. Those here where you should have all these physical chemical characterization, epidemiological test results, classification, waste management, also also, uh, also the result of the of the testing on, on animals, uh, one of the purposes of each is also collecting data and as a decreased number of these animals tests, and uh, also uh, and also uh, also uh, environmental data for uh, for case of any 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 any, any um, I would say the accident in, uh, in application or uh, or production of this chemical substance. Uh, the, the picture uh, which you, you see below the age 2018 uh, looks as, as a final step or, or final goal for each. That was the idea of a lot of uh, people in, in the industry, but that's definitely not reality. It, it, uh, I would say it's, it's the beginning of the age, of real age, uh, because now uh, since this time, we should have uh, adjusted all substance and now we, uh, we can, can and we should work uh, how uh, how to use this data to classify it to to elim and to, to eliminate the dangerous chemical substance from European market. Uh, I mentioned it uh, before the registration number. Registration number. Here you see the, the example of uh, of uh, thalidomides, uh, and uh, that's always fourteen uh, and uh, and four numbers or digits uh, as in a code. Uh, before you have the prefix, which we give you information if it's for registration or registration number. In body, you, you have the number in which identify the part, uh, particle chemical and uh, chemicals and uh, give you information about, about the substance. And the last four digits, it, it indicates the resistance. That means uh, who was, the, was the, the, uh, the company or institution who did the registration. It's very important because uh, 
uh, on the same registration number, uh, you you can have the you can you can have the different uh, the different registrants. Uh, another another step of the of the reach is authorization. That means the process which uh, works with the substance which which were identified as a dangerous or not in in uh, in uh, let's say in interest of European community. Since the beginning, uh, there was identification uh, of the of some candidate list, which is every six months updated by European Chemistry Agency. Uh, important inputs uh, is done by mem member states, and member states also are, are, are the bodies who uh, will make the will make the evaluation uh, of these substance if they are in the interest of European community or not. Uh, Nowadays, uh, the last version or uh, last update of the uh, candidate list is on January the 17th, when, where now we can see 233 substances. Um, uh, most of all, all the substances are, are classified by as a carcinogenic, reprotoxic, PBT, or VPV, or as an endocrine disruptors. Uh, from this list, uh, usually uh, substance follow to the substance of a high concern list and to Annex 14. Very important point is that uh, by the article 30 of each, uh, all parties in the supply chain uh, who use of uh, any of these uh, of these uh, substance over here concern in their products or mixtures or chemical substance uh, above 0.1 percent must inform uh, all the supply chain. One 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 remark. Uh, now we speak about the about the official uh, official list of the substance overhead content. There are a lot of uh, uh, NGOs list with more than thousands of chemical substances which uh, uh, and different NGOs would like to 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 push to the uh, to the evaluation by by ECA. Good question. Uh, if all of them are uh, let's say reliable or realistic, but uh, we should still uh, take into consideration these activities. Restrictions uh, is a diff different way how to uh, how to eliminate uh, the chemical substance. U usually, uh, different between restrictions and uh, authorization is uh, in in the timing, uh, because authorization is uh, at least for five years uh, as a possibility to find the time for find a, any other solution for European industry. In case of restriction, restriction there, there, there is without any sunset dates. But on the other hand, uh, authorization uh, can uh, can be uh, identified for specific use. In case of restriction, we can we we can we can we can uh, find a way uh, uh, with some specific use uh, of chemicals substance which can be allowed or uh, or for, or uh, let's say postpone it for, for restrictions. That's important because not always, not always, the chemical substance is restricted or authorized for all different use. Also, it's a new, new let's say, approach uh, when we, where we make different differentiation between or among different uh, different use of the chemical substance. Well, uh, if anyone would import any chemical substance to Europe, to European community or to European market. Uh, need need, need to do the registration uh, via importers or via OR. So uh, OR only representative. There are no specific requests of, like uh, education or experience, but it should be, or it must be Europe EU-based companies, consultants, activity uh, initiatives, etc. Often uh, quite often are in Ireland, Greece, Finland, and the United Kingdom. United Kingdom uh, was okay before the Brexit, but now. Uh, uh, it was uh, it was stopped, and uh, uh, com uh, companies or OR in in UK cannot uh, cannot uh, continue in this position for for the future. Uh, in in case of import, importance uh, are volumes, distribution channels, and the classification are and labeling and reporting regarding the 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 volumes and classification. Uh, it's uh, also uh, important part of the custom uh, declaration. Brexit uh, made uh, a big problem for uh, for let's say exchange of the chemicals between Europe and the UK. Uh, UK now they, they now they established the, their own system 
which uh, not followed our European uh, European uh, systems, but uh, from uh, I would say 80 90 percent, uh, uh, the legal requirements are very similar. But the positioning of, of the positioning in the supply chains and in the registration process are different, and it's very important to uh, take into consideration uh, if you if you use any materials or any chemical substance which is originally coming from the UK. Uh, we speak about the, uh, we speak about the reach, but uh, may, maybe be better expression would be the EU reach because other countries like China, Korea, Turkey, Brazil, USA. Uh, especially California, uh, Russia, Japan, Switzerland, they have their, their own system of regulations. Uh, I would say that uh, all these uh, different uh, systems uh, followed um, main, main principles, uh, the, the main the same principles, but a lot of differences in uh, institution and in, uh, in, in the timelines and also in the fees of uh, which is uh, need to be paid in case of, if you want to penetrate it to their market. Very important uh, point is enforcement of reach because uh, in the beginning and on, honestly speaking also now, there are a lot lack of, uh, lack, lack of uh, uh, analytical methods and uh, also lack of uh, capacities uh, of enforcement bodies on the national, uh, on the national level. Uh, but there, there are some cooperation bet uh, on, on, uh, uh, between, between them. And uh, also uh, quite uh, in good shape is the exchange of information. That means if once uh, you uh, import the chemical substance to one member state, uh, but you are based in another member state, uh, uh, the, the exchange of information be uh, between, the, between the bodies work quite well. Specific uh, case uh, for enforcement is a gray, gray import, that means uh, some chemical substance which which cause the border uh, cause the border without uh, without let's say accepting the rules and also the chemical substance which is produced originally in EU exported out of EU and then coming back to uh, back to Europe the European Union market. Here here uh, I share with you some uh, some typical uh, example of incorrect uh, data in supply chains. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, wrong classification. Sometimes, uh, uh, some, sometimes uh, a, a wrong, a wrong, uh, a wrong uh, uh, dates for the registration. Uh, but uh, the requirements uh, are now now fulfilled. What's the future development? Uh, now uh, we are, we have under discussion the, the registration of polymers because up to now polymers were one of the exemption from the each monomers. Uh, was part of the but, but polymers no but now now uh, now we see big discussions on the polymers registration process uh, interest of uh, of ECA specific uh, legislation uh, need to be taken into consideration in, in case of endocrine disruptors nano substances and special legislation for biocides I underline the biocides especially here when, when we speak about the uh, chemical substance used for uh, wood preservation. Uh, and uh, there, is, there are some, sometimes a little, little bit cause of the interest of the reach and bio uh, and bio that's na national uh, national legislative, but uh, reach needs need, need to be taken as, as a basic tool for all European countries. Also, we uh, we, uh, we, prob we probably or oh, I'm sure we will see development of a substance of very high concern list uh, and new candidate new new candidate chemical substance which will be uh, identified by uh, by each member state country and last but not least also a uh, very very open question is regarding the circular materials and recycling uh, materials how to uh, work with them under their each because there are a lot of uh, unclearness between uh, the, uh, the, the, the ECA and uh, and uh, European producers and, and last but not least also different approach uh, was taken in the past uh, by different member states uh, but uh, but the circular materials uh, under their each it's also one of the future acts for the uh, for, for the development on, on, on these restrictions. Well, now we are in the end. If there are any question now or later on, here is my contact, and I'm I'm open to answer the answer the I think any questions. <laughs>